really good to be here. Thank you um, for all the invitations and conversations I've had so far. Um, before I start my speech, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in the past and present and those to come in the future. Those people have actually held the earth in the palm of their hands and looked after it for us, I believe, at this precise moment. And so now it's our job to take forward those aspects and work with them in a collaborative way. Uh, so thank you for the work that you've done, the people you've always done. Um, All right, so, so I was given the task of doing the keynote, and um, I came to think about Wanda. And, um, and I was sitting there with the gin and tonic, as you do, and I was thinking, <laughs> but really, you know, for me, I am, in both sense of the word, both a wanderer, in that I wander all over the planet, it seems, at the moment, um, which is very nice, and I meet lots of people around the world who are really positive and um, engaging people. I also meet lots of people who are what I call fish faces, the doer, happiness-sucking people that you'll meet, who don't understand the natural world, who often just stand like this. Those are the people that many of us have been suggesting exist in their, in their work, and it's very true. They're not in this room. They do operate as a shoal sometimes, sadly, um, and that when one of you gets into a room full of fish faces, it can feel very daunting because you're there standing for nature, and you're also there standing for the rights of children to be in nature. So be strong, and hopefully in this um, speech I'm going to share with you some of my wonderings about where we're going as a human race, but also share with you some of the stories from my other form of wanderings as I travel around the world. So let me introduce home. Well, it's not home. People know that. It's on a castle. I don't live in a castle. <laughs> um, I keep saying to people that big drafty places with rats, um, yeah. They're also, I'm afraid, iconic in terms of the British domain. And so I apologise now on behalf of the British Empire. If we came to your country and sold things, mistreated you in any way, I say sorry for that. <laughs> um, we are now struggling with invasive species, and Helmand it serves us right because we stole them. Um, and now they're causing us real problems, so it's all come out. But the reason I'm showing you this photograph is to really summarise the four things that I have found as I've travelled that really impact on the way that we engage with the natural world. And the first one is the climate. So this is it in Scotland. See the raining, just about to rain, just stopped raining. So that's it really. <laughs> so when people say I'm only going to go out in fair weather, I'm like, well, fair weather would be about two days a year. That's it in Scotland. So we have to get past the weather and understand that actually we work in synergy with the natural world. We have to understand when to be outside. And I am somewhat concerned about the fact that we seem to be appearing to become survivor people. Um, we had a visitor come to Ochloan Nature Kindergarten and um, we were walking up from the main house to the cottage, up through the forest to the firehouse to eat. And the lady next to me said, is it time now? And I went, sorry? And she said, is it time? Oh, time? I said, ah, okay, sorry, I'm really not getting it. She said, well, you know, it's a nature kindergarten, do we have to catch it? Catch it? What do you mean? The rabbit? Why do we have to catch a rabbit? Well, oh, because we're going to kill it for lunch, eh? <laughs> and I said, no, we just went to the market and bought some food. That's kind of what we do here. But it made me realise that there's a whole body of people that see us. If you're not careful, you become very extreme. You become, you know, we can only kill or eat stuff that's, you know, in our place that we have big hairy armpits and only like, wear big hand woven shoes. Be careful. Good you have to be careful that you don't become that extreme because really it's a child's right, mainstream right, to be in nature. So part of what I'm going to do in this speech is to talk about that range and that continuum of experiences for children that I've seen around the world. And climates vary. That's the way the world was built. But there's no point in wittering on about the weather. You just have to learn to deal with it and get outside your door. The second thing is the cultural placement, and we're very close to the Nordic countries, where we are in Scotland, and I just point out we're not England, and we're not Wales, we are Scotland, the top part of the United Kingdom, even though your current president announced he was leaving London and the UK to go to travel to Scotland. I'm saying no more than that. That for us is important is that we don't do what I call educational colonization. 
but we don't take models of nature-based practice from one part of the world and implant them on top of children and places and people and environments that aren't suited to that way of working. So we have to adapt and change what we do and put it to our place, to our sense of who we are and who our culture and community are. The third aspect on there is the curriculum. And in Scotland, um, to give you hope, about 12, 13 years ago, when we set up the first nature kindergarten in Scotland, I had lots of conversations with licensing. And it went along the lines of, hello, are you Claire Warden? Phone me up. I said, are you Claire Warden? I said, yes, I am. I said, are you one of those wacky women in the woods? <laughs> Yeah, what do you think of me? And he said, well, what I want to talk to you about is sticks. So I said, all right. They're short, they're fat, they're thin, they come from trees. And he said, I think you're being cheeky. And I said, I think you're being inane. Because why do you want me to talk about sticks? And he said, well, really, the point of this conversation is could you remove all the sticks? <laughs> I'm in a forest. I'm in a forest. That means I would have to cut down the forest to remove all the trees. Now that's 13 years ago, and now in Scotland we have a curriculum called the Curriculum for Excellence. And the expectation from you as an educator is that you deliver 50% of your core teaching time outside, in the natural environment. We've also now, the Scottish Government has committed by 2020 to increase the number of outdoor nurseries across the whole of Scotland and support that um, financially and through business and training and everything else. So we've moved from a place of aversion to a place where the Scottish Government is now embracing the models around nature-based pedagogies. Um, so let me move on because I need to explain a little bit about who I am, because I'm a relational ontologist, apparently. That means my world view is that I believe in relationships to each other, to the land, to the people who have gone before and those that will come in the future. And so on your table, or on your chair, sorry, when you came in, you were given a little key ring. And on that key ring, there's a wee bit of plant, a little bit of tartan. If you can get that in front of you just now. <laughs> Alright. So, many people I talk to have been to Scotland or feel they have some ancestry and connection to Scotland. Would you like to show me if you have? People that you know of now. Great. Okay. Maybe you don't know where your tartan comes from, but if at the break time you want to come and have a look, I did bring a map of Scotland with the associated tartans because your identity in Scotland is based on your tartan, on your plant. Um, I'm from the McFarland clan, and that means that we live in the Moraysha area um, of Scotland, and it means that for us, this is the colours of our land. So they went out and they got the wool, they went out and got the plants, they created a plaid, if you like, an interwoven fabric that we wrapped around ourselves and hid in the heather um, to either shoot or to run away from English, really, actually, you know. <laughs> anyway, we <laughs> just there. Um, and so, for me, it's about identity. So when you look at your tartan, you may think, well, this is really bright. And it's very true, there are modern tartans that are in luminous colours, bright green, bright orange, bright yellow. They've got nothing to do with ancestry and connection, they're just a trendy thing to have. So you can come to Edinburgh and buy any kilt you like. It means absolutely nothing, but you can buy the kilt if you want to. The second thing that we have are the ancients, right? And the ancient plaids are the ones that fascinate me, because they are the colours, as I said, of the land. But for me, the plaid that you've got in your hand represents many things. It rep represents, I suppose, the interwoven nature of our existence on the planet. That we as a human species need to work together and collaborate. The fact that we together can share our knowledge and our skills and our and attitudes to create a force for change. That actually there's ancient wisdoms and things that we can learn from in a respectful way that we can take forward in our programming. I also need to explain that I have the family with me and you may have seen Emily, my daughter, travelling. For me, family and relationship and human-to-human -human relationship are everything. And when people say to me, well, what is your PhD about, this nature pedagogy thing? Well, for me, nature pedagogy is the art of being. It's the art of being with nature, inside, outside, and beyond. And that means inside in terms of the metaphor of yourself, who you are in your identity, outside in terms of your relationship with others, and beyond in terms of how you work as a community, but inside, outside, beyond also represents a space. 
inside buildings, outside buildings, and beyond into wilder spaces. And one of the things that we did was to look at that very early age for infants and toddlers and say, what does it look like for an infant? Nature pedagogy, what does it look like for an infant? And so what we did was we measured the distance between a group of young children at six weeks old who were coming into long daycare environments and the distance they were from a human heartbeat. Because for me, that's the start of that connectivity. How far were they from a human heartbeat? What do you think? How far do you think? Give me a guess. Ten feet. Ten feet? Well, probably not far off, actually. What we found was that they were over there. And as soon as you start saying the baby or infant is over there, it implies there is a detachment from the human heartbeat. And so in many cultures, in many spaces that I work, those young infants are actually here, held against the human heart. And it's through hearing that human heartbeat that they learn to self-regulate, that they learn to hear the rhythms of a human being. So nature pedagogy isn't something about just going into wild spaces. It starts from infancy and goes right the way through to old age and death. So in this book, um, you may have read this, or if you have, um, doesn't matter if you haven't, but this is one of the most recent books that I've done. And, and in it, I was challenging myself to wonder because I was traveling around and saying, you know what, I've read every document, I've read screeds of pamphlets, I've read academic papers, and I was still seeing people who were struggling to get a grasp, I suppose, of what this work is that we're doing. So then when I said to myself, I'm gonna use graphics. So I started using drawing and diagrams of practice to help me try to understand what it was that was going on. And so the Wondering Why program really just started to make me wonder, why is it that in our world that we have children who have this right, and they have the joyful rite of passage to climb a tree to push their boundaries, but they also have children who live and work, not live and work, but they play and work in this, which looks more like a prison, thanks to Arab's conversation we were having, this looks more like a prison than a preschool. And yet architecture is taking away the children's right to actually engage in the natural world. I went to an Aboriginal children's centre and invited on country to do that um, in Tasmania, South Hobart. And one of the things that the Aboriginal elders were talking to me about was their right to, to be on country. But licensing had come in and implanted on top of that culture the need for separation and division. So there was a pen for children who were infants, there was a pen for children who were two, a pen for children who were three, and I used the word pen intentionally. People say, oh, they're areas of play. No, they're not. They're pens. And so children were engaging in those spaces, but when you got down to the child's eye height, this is what they saw. They saw bars of containment. They saw about boundaries. They saw about limitations, not about expansive views that we're all trying to create. Then what happened was, you know, I started to wonder why, why did the people who wrote the Oxford English Dictionary agree to remove the words of nature? They have now removed words like blackberry, minnow, acorn from the dictionary because somebody in a room said they are of no use to us anymore. In society, we don't need to know about nature words. What we'll do is replace them, and we'll replace them with cut and paste or the internet. Um, which I find totally fascinating. And Robert McFarlane is one person I would say to, to have a look at. His uh, program now is called Words, and he's now trying to instill in people the understanding that you are integrated, your language stems from the natural world. It's our root for developing language. And the more you go into um, other communities, the more you realize how close that connection was and how separated we've become. So then I started to think about why, why is it happening that we look at curriculum in different ways? So many places in countries I visit look at curriculum like this. They have a curriculum document, they cut it up, all right? They take the outcome, they plan an activity to do for children, they then get children to do it, um, and then they record what children do, all right? That's a very didactic system, but it is one that the Western paradigm of education believes is the right model. I would argue that my work and many of your work sits more comfortably within this model. And this model is about what I'm calling participatory planning, but it's about that engagement, the stimulus that the natural world gives us, these moments of awe, of awe and wonder, these moments of fascination that we're also very aware of. 
that children physically engage in that moment. But then we evidence their documents and through documentation, and then we track back to a curriculum. So I wonder why and how we ended up on those two different routes in terms of understanding the place of curricula. I wonder who, and I'm very good at wondering, so this could go on forever, but I wonder who. Um, I'm wondering who was, who's going to be my next dance partner? Because for me, I think we need to engage in what I would call pedagogical dance. And the pedagogical dance isn't about someone always taking the lead. It's about ebb and flow. It's about finding that partner. It's about learning the steps of the dance and understanding what does this look like? And how do I engage with children so that sometimes they lead and sometimes I lead? And that we integrate all the people around that child in that community to be part of a strong pedagogical dance. The hard dance steps to follow would be those people who you don't actually like being with. <laughs> the fish faces of the world are the ones you need to learn to dance with. All right, so imagine your heart when you're at some dance, when you were young, free, and single, and you try to look across the room and catch the eye of the person you wanted to dance with, and then think about how you scanned around and thought, I don't want to dance with them, and then that was the one you danced with. That's the moment you need to embrace. You need to have difficult conversations, and you need to have difficult dances with people who may feel awkward in their understanding of this world. Because otherwise, we'll just be looking at ourselves, saying how brilliant we are, and not having those difficult conversations. So this is one of the diagrams of practice I did, and it's based on Brock from Bella's research. And what I tried to do here was to say, these are all the people that you need to engage with in terms of this agenda we have about nature-based learning. And right in the heart of that, of course, is the child and family. Um, and going out from that, you have all the different facets, whether it be the local amenities, like the, the zoos, the parks, but you can go out with that and look at those bigger uh, organisations for change, for environmental change, but also curricular change. And beyond that, we need to look at the culture and economics and law and politics. Those have to be part of our conversation and our dance. And then underneath it, Bron from Bennett talks a lot about something called the Chrono system which is the socio-cultural time. And one thing that I find quite interesting about the tartan aspect is that people will say to me, well, you know, Claire, there's no point in doing fire, really, because we've got central heating. We don't need fire anymore. Why are you bothering with the element of fire? So I actually, I bother with all four elements of fire, earth, air, wind, water. But I do it because they are the context for the learning. They are the thing that gives us the fascination, the wonder and awe that helps us drive forward our learning. So I wonder when. I wonder when we're going to start doing this. <laughs> so thanks to Google for this. We do what we call anthropomorphism, which is that we turn the animal kingdom or plant kingdom into likeness of us, into ways that we feel are acceptable to the human being. And the reason we do that is that we have placed ourselves as human beings at the top of a tower. We place ourselves here as dominant over the natural world. Actually, for me, in my ontology, the shape is a circle, and we are an integral part of the natural world. So for me to dress up a chihuahua, um, it just wouldn't feature in my um, thinking, to be honest. But if you're in the room and you like chihuahuas and you like dressing them up, good luck with that. <laughs> I wonder where, and I wonder where, you know, where, where, where are we going to do this stuff? And so I started to share some images around the world, but as I travel around the world, actually what I do find is more similarity than difference. I actually, this was in uh, Barnahaga in Norway, um, and the Barnahaga was lovely, um, but what I actually really loved about this place was its sense of ownership and connection to people who've gone before. So at the very back of the picture up here, at the very back, you can see a very flat Sami shelter, um, which is traditional um, for the nomadic groups in northern Norway. But they'd also then built the red, what you call warming stöger, which has got the higher area at the top, which is where you go up to warm up. It's traditionally where people kept straw and hay for the winter. Um, and those, both of those ancient traditions were then, I suppose, emerged within a new tradition, which was created by the children in that place. So the area that the little boy is on is actually a sandpit, and it comes to the winter time when the first frosts come, and the children break out the sandpit to make it nice and flat, and then the older children in this environment then flood 
the sun bed over a sequence of days to make an ice skating rink. And that's part of their tradition and ceremony of being in that space and giving back to land. And it is something I think that as stewards of the planet, we need to support our children to understand that that is part of their role. I've now begun, I suppose, one of the downsides of doing a PhD, it's almost at the end now, actually, about weeks ago. Um, one of the things about that is you do start to analyse every word you say. Um, so one of the words I've been playing around is, is, is it the site? Is it the site? Is it about saying, I've got a forest or a beach? Is it that? Or is it actually not that at all? Is it actually more about the situations that we create, irrespective of where we are, that develop this relational ontology for children between themselves and the natural world. So this is the entrance to Home Nature Kindergarten. And when we asked the children, how do you want to come in? They said, well, not with my mum and my dad. I want to come in a different way. Okay. So we asked them what they wanted, and they said, well, I'd really like a gate. So we made a little tiny gate. And we'd really like an arch. So they planted an arch. And we'd like a bridge. And then some children said to me, well, I don't really want to come in at all. Okay. <laughs> so we made a people board. So this one, this end, is the people board for those children who just need a bit more time to come into the space. So entering spaces and boundaries have made me really think about these transitional spaces that exist, whether it's between your inside and your outside space, whether it's between your outside space and going beyond into the wilderness. Those transitional points are hugely powerful for young children in terms of nature-based learning and the expectation of what's to come. When you start looking at models like the Nature Kindergarten model that I tend to adopt, one of the things about it for me is that the learning moves across those three spaces. And so this really is just a diagram of practice to show the fact that there's a starting moment, and the moment has come from children up in the forest. But the learning experience then moves to be present and replicated and mimicked within an outside play area. And there are elements of that learning that move inside for them to explore deeply within areas of provocation. And then it might move outside. So journeys and meanderings and wanderings happen across learning um, across those three spaces in the work that we do. When I started to really closely observe children, I began to think, you know what? I'm really wondering about this idea about situations when children can find awe and wonder inside a log and ignore completely the landscape that somebody has created. <laughs> Today, or yesterday, sorry, in the zoo, I, took a, I saw a little two-year-old who was fascinated by a little corner of dirt that happened to be near an open grate, and he just picked up little bits of dirt and dropped them into the grate. But his mother pulled him away to go and see nature. And I thought that was really interesting. That, but in those moments, um, like this, there is what you call a hylomorphic moment, which is that connection between the child and the, the natural object, if you like, the material, the matter that they're touching. And I see this repeated, the reaching out, the touching happens in a moment. It doesn't happen in a massive landscape. It helps if it's in a massive landscape. But don't lose heart because actually I've seen this wonderment in a window box. So it's as long as it is there and children have some access to it, um, I think we have these moments that are, are very powerful. I wonder if Gandhi ever got really fed up. That was another thought I had. <laughs> I was recently in uh, Barcelona doing some work and I went into uh, Sagrada Familia, um, which is a phenomenal place. And Gandhi himself wasn't really recognised within his own lifetime. Um, but one of the things about this basilica is that he based it on the natural kingdom, if you've ever been there. And I was full of that. I was looking at him, oh, look at that. And he's made columns that look like trees. The ceiling looked like bracts of flowers, it was wonderful. And so I walked in, but actually, when I walked in, it wasn't just about the building, it was the emotional resonance that existed between the people in that place. That was the power of what he had actually done, not the building itself. And so you saw adults with this playful awe, this idea that they could put colour on their hand and dance about, you saw that childlike exuberance come out of adults when they were in this space. Some people tried to capture it, and they, they could see there was a need to capture. And um, one of the things I would say that we discussed yesterday at the, uh, the day that we had was about the need to document, and the fact that there should be days where there is no documentation. 
there should be days when there is no camera. Because actually, if you put the camera between yourself and the child in the environment, you lose what I would call the emotional resonance, which is that unseen, unobservable moment where we feel some resonance within us. I would say, for me, I find that beauty in this space. I find those same moments of sense of connectedness when I walk through light like this, and I, I cannot help but think I am part of something much bigger than just being a human being. So when you go around the world, you will see many, many models and ways of doing this work that we're all enthusiastic about. One of the things, sadly, I now see, though, is people who are building silos, silos of identity, which means that um, I hear a little bit of superiority coming in. So um, the one at the top left here is actually a boat kindergarten. They don't have a building, they have a boat. And they work on the fields of uh, Sweden and Norway. Um, and that means that when they're in the boat, the children choose their destination. And somebody said to me, well, I'm not a boat kindergarten, I'm a forest school. So oh, great, you're a forest school, that's very nice. Yeah, well, I used to be just an ordinary centre, but now I'm a forest school. Okay, so, so when did we decide as a human race then that this model has to be better than this model? When did we get so superior in our thinking that we, we could take judgment about somebody else's journey into nature? When did we get to that point where we became so supercilious about the natural world that we felt we could do that? So my point to people is we all have place. And one of the things, again, is to say, in some water environments where I work, I cannot go outside. So the natural world has to come inside. And you need to listen to the stories of the people next to you, to understand their ontology, their worldview about their place, and understand that they're too on a journey into some of this work. We could do this. I call it the Bayanakia classroom. Um, yeah, it's biophilic design. Um, we really can't and get it, so it helps us understand. And biophilic design is the thing that is manifested in many models. People asked me earlier on today, what's my connection to Reggio Emilia? I said, know Carla and Aldi quite well. Um, and when Carla and I get together, I think people think it's like design sophistication meets the rough end. <laughs> <laughs> if you've met Carla and Aldi, she's very Italian, uh, very smart, very sophisticated. And I don't know what they think I am, but I'm obviously the other end. <laughs> But one of the things about that is that actually we have the very same view of children as being confident and capable. We are rights-based in our thinking. We believe that actually it's about social constructivism, understanding we learn in a group. Those things aren't the same. And so this looks very much like um, classrooms that you might see or settings you might see in Italy. But if you go to northern Italy, you see another model called the farm kindergarten. And the farm kindergarten was set up by the municipality to make sure that farmers and the understanding of the origins of your food were manifested in the seasonal variations that were going on around um, the year, if you like, for these young children, because there was becoming a disconnect between the food we eat and our understanding of its origin. Some people ask me, well, what happens if I just, I'm in my home? Fabulous, be in your home. Be in your home and embrace the natural world. Be in your home and look outside the window, if that's all you can do. Be in your home and step outside the back door and play in a puddle on the pavement. Eat healthily. Think about the food, where it comes from. And then you have um, outdoor spaces. And I know we have colleagues and friends in the room who are very good at doing landscape design. And they're good at doing landscape design because they listen to what children have to say. One of the things about those landscape designs is that they have to have intentionality, of course, um, and some of the transformative stuff that we do is, is truly remarkable. But I'm also constantly in wonder and awe of people who are so tenacious they can create um, a Shangri-La, a place of harmony, in the most hostile environments. And so this was actually on the top of a car park in Seattle. Um, a wonderful lady called Sue Hoogloom, um, lovely, lovely woman, created ACORN Early, Le Early Learning Centre, and she, she campaigned for the top of the car park. And one of my favourite stories was actually they discovered that many of the homeless people were coming to the car park to sleep. And rather than saying, putting up barriers to say, don't come, don't come, the children just wrote a letter saying, or a message, a sign saying, welcome, please just don't put your fag ends in our fire pit. So, great. so come, but please don't destroy our space. 
So for many people, we have no choice but to pack our bags and leave our environments to go to the beyond. And so the beyond for me is nature on nature's terms. And that means that we um, are embracing everything that space offers. It's not canned, it's not processed. And one of the conversations I had with Carla was about the fact that there is a tendency for some people to only pick the beautiful stuff. To go out into the natural world and find the perfect stone, the gorgeous flower, the beautiful chick. And yet for me, I wonder what that means for children if all they see is perfection. What does that say to children in an implicit way about inclusivity? If all you see is the beautiful flower, but you don't see the flower that has got an, um, an, a thing that doesn't work, or uh, the chick that hatched with a leg that doesn't walk, what, what about that message? What message do you give? So for me, it's always about saying, we need to look at nature on nature's terms. What it offers us, offers us in these moments is critical, I think, for helping children understand biodiversity, but also diversity of the human species. So the space beyond, um, and many people ask me, well, what about the space beyond, and should I be striving for the space beyond? I think it's a lovely place to be, but it's not the journey and destination for everybody. I think I was taught a huge amount by an Aboriginal community in Western Australia. I was invited to go on country, so this environment is 600 kilometres from the nearest um, township. So I flew in on the doctor's plane. Um, and was left, basically, in the middle of the Red Desert, um, which is a little scary, because you begin to realise that actually, I could die here. <laughs> and one of the things I think we've forgotten is how subjective we are with tiny as humans, really, in the bigger world realm. And the community invited me in, and one of the things that we were doing was looking at the programming, what was happening within the, the school and the early years setting. And I walked in, and there was a Dutch barn in the early years environment, so, you know, your red barn with your white things on and I began to wonder, why, why are people thinking that it's an aspirational thing to have a Western version of a barn? Why would we not value the Aboriginal version of that, the Mia Mia, or the shelter? Or why would we not place that? And the idea was, I think, for those people, was that the aspiration was to become Western. And I was very clear to point out that actually most of the Western world is trying desperately hard to get back to a place where we connect in synergy with the natural world. So I went out onto the salt plains, and so we went out to a big salt lake called Lake Dora, and um, I went out, I was taken out with the elders on country, and um, the children took their uh, shoes off and things like that, so I thought I'll follow suit. Took my shoes off, and, and to this day I wonder what they saw, because I must have looked like that little lizard on the sand, because I had to look like this. <laughs> Because it was well over 100 degrees, well over, all right? And so they laughed at me and said, that's really funny you're doing that, why are you doing that? And I was like, I have no idea why I'm just doing that. <laughs> I'm really sorry. So we need to be humble. We need to always have humility in our hearts, because if you lose humility, you, I think, forget to see. See yourself, see others uh, looking at you and how you respond to them, but see what the reality is for you. And so a um, little boy, um, um, asked if I would go out and make mud. So we went out, and for this little boy, the Lake Dora um, evaporates at certain points of the year, and because he goes there, it's his land, he knows what is the right time of year to go to this area, which is where it's the last area where the water disappears, where he could gather and pull up the soft clay that was at the bottom of the lake and make it into a ball and start to sculpture things. And he knows that there's a seasonal variation a time and a place when that should be done. And often I think in the Western world, what we start to believe is that we could do what we like when we want to do it. So our example in Scotland is always bouncing strawberries come Christmas. People say, I want a strawberry. And I go, so they're not ripe strawberries. No, I must have strawberries today. Right. Well, you can get them, but is it the right thing to do? And so I learned a huge amounts from this little boy. So he knew this knowledge. He knew that actually, if you wait another couple of weeks, there's a really good football pitch waiting for you. But we could go out on Lake Dora and kick a ball about. That knowledge comes from being with. It comes from settlement. It comes from repeated access to the same place over many, many times. So the beyond space may look like this. 
The beyond space may look like this. Or this. Or this. Or this. I could go on. But if your beyond space is no more than a balcony, does it or is it valued less? I would argue no. In the, in the moment when that child is out on that balcony feeling the air in their hair, when they touch that leaf, when they find that blade of grass, it has the same power as connection to that child as being a massive expanse of space. So many people work in parks and apologize to me. You should never apologize for where you work. Be proud of where you are. Be proud of the fact that you're out there with young children in these amazing environments. So rather than talking about environments as being the site, I ask people and urge people to think more about your situations. What are the situations that you're striving to create? What are the behaviours in the children that you're trying to nourish to help them to flourish? So part of that doctoral study, I suppose, was trying to work out a way of bringing that together. And I used the analogy of a mushroom, a fungus, to say that actually underneath all of those models, there is what we call the mycelium, the interconnected meshwork that Ingold talks about in his research that allows many people to have many different models that you can see manifesting at the top of this picture because of, as a result of your life of climate, culture, curriculum, they adapt the way our model looks, but underneath all of those models resides the values and beliefs that I consider to be about nature pedagogy. So I started to map out, and many people do continuums, but this continuum for me was about the integration and segregation from the philosophy um, of nature pedagogy. Remembering for me, nature pedagogy is a way of being. And so at this end, I, I live in the world of segregation from nature pedagogy. People who don't feel the need to be outside of nature. Um, they see time as being something they can divide and divide and divide and divide and have no impact on children's learning. I see people who believe it is their role to tell rather than to nourish learning from children. So this end is where Fishface lives. <laughs> and then you go around the other end, and the other end is the integration of the values of nature pedagogy. And in those environments, you might have heard things like Barna Harga, uh, Volk Kindergarten, I know Andreas somewhere in the room who's been talking about the Volk Kindergartens from Germany. You could go to um, Sweden and find the Stoltenmühle. Um, that's another model, but that's, um, I suppose, driven by the presence of trolls and spirits within the, that particular model. You could decide that you want to go to a nature group. You might go and find Bush Pindi if you're in Australia. So we have all these models that sit at that end, where the adult sees their role as being a mindful, silent pedagogue. Which doesn't mean you just go and stand in the corner. It means there's a mindful presence, an awareness of that emotional resonance that takes place. And it may well be that you're somewhere in the middle. You may be over here thinking, well, I don't know where I am yet. And that's fine because it's all about a journey and not about the destination. It's about finding your pathway through all this myriad of information we're given now to understand where's your place, your identity, and then widen that to find those people who work with you whilst holding on to that global connectivity of the values of nature pedagogy. So people ask me about why I set it up. Well, there wasn't really a plan to set it up. Truth be known, um, things happen when you go in the bar um, up on the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and various friends are in the room who were in that bar when we thanks Alan. Um, and what we started to do was to say, you know what we need to do? We need to stop the silo mentality where you've got one people here going, one other group going, but we're forest schools, we can't be forest schools. And another group here going, well, I'm a beach school, I'm not forest school. Well, actually, I'm this and I'm not that, and I'm this and I'm not that. And so the divisions were becoming more and more and more obvious. So we said, I know what we'll do. We'll get a load of people who are really into this, and our virtual network will connect and um, hopefully build a relationship. And so um, what happened from that, so we've got people like Richard Liu, David Sabell, Adam's on there, um, Kunda Renin, Wendy Lee, um, various colleagues who have written a lot, uh, Rachel Arnold, who's in the room, I would hope, um, there are various people around the world who've been doing lots of writing and innovation about this work. So they came together to be the advisory panel, and I thank them for their support. And then it grew again, because then people said, actually, what we want is just country-based information. 
So we then set up these little globes. There are more than that. There's about 40 globes now and 40 different countries who've signed up to be part of this association. There is no membership fee. Uh, like NIMPA, we're saying it's not about the membership um, that you pay, it's about your commitment to what you're doing. Um, and so in those country-based um, globes, they're really just the signposts to find organizations. So in America, you're going to find people like the Frost Kindergarten Association. You're going to find people like Natural Starts Alliance, like NIMPA, to allow people to connect to each other within the country. And then once a year, so next year we're going to Brazil, we're delighted to be here in Chicago, um, but next year it's Brazil, and the year after that I think it may well be India. We are taking the um, conference on tour, if you like, and it's about drawing public attention to the agenda of nature-based pedagogy. <coughs> so, I've managed to keep the time, I'm very proud of myself. Um, I leave you with this image, <coughs> and I don't think Emily is actually in the room, so well, that's a shame, because I wanted to mortify her, but anyway. <laughs> Um, this is my daughter, Emily, and the reason I really set up Off Bone Nature Kindergarten was because I'd written a book called Nurture Through Nature, which is about children from birth to three being outside. And I had watched her, I had noticed her in a way that I had never done before. And through doing that, I began to realise that, that for her to flourish, <coughs> for her to flourish, she needed to be in a space where there was more space where she was embraced by the natural world, inside, outside, and beyond. So although she's not in the room, I do thank her, because she's certainly been a very important part of my journey, just as all of you are as well. <clears throat> so thank you very much for listening to me, and I look forward to chatting with you over the next few days. Thank you very much.